First of all, Mr. President, if you'll allow me, on behalf of myself and um, all Jordanians to uh, welcome you and your distinguished uh, delegation uh, back here uh, in Jordan. Uh, I fondly remember uh, your visit here uh, several years ago when you were a senator, uh, and it is a great delight to welcome you back to Jordan uh, as the President of the United States uh, enjoying your, your second term. Uh, we are delighted uh, with the in-depth discussions that were very, very fruitful uh, on our strategic uh, and historic partnership, uh, and you have been an old friend, uh, as has the United States for so many decades. We are very grateful to you, sir, and the administration, uh, as well as Congress uh, and the American people for the continuous support uh, that has been shown um, to Jordan over so many uh, years. And the U.S. assistance um, that has helped us um, throughout so many years has allowed us to get uh, Jordan to where we are uh, today, and hopefully uh, will continue to help us uh, advance uh, our shared goals of development, security, uh, and regional peace. We did have the opportunity to discuss Syria, uh, and obviously we are all horrified uh, by the loss of life and the brutality uh, of the conflict. Uh, we are extremely concerned uh, of the risk of prolonged uh, sectarian uh, conflict, uh, that if it continues, as we are seeing, uh, leads to the fragmentation of Syria, uh, which obviously will have disastrous consequences uh, on the region for generations uh, to come. Uh, therefore, it is, immediate, uh, it is important to have immediate need for an inclusive uh, political transition that ends the conflict uh, and the threats that emanate uh, from it. Uh, what we are facing now today, obviously, is an urgent need for international uh, community to help in uh, um, humanitarian assistance to catch up uh, to the challenges that we are facing as the countries uh, bordering uh, Syria. And not only do we need to look at the ability to stockpile humanitarian supplies to the Syrian people inside their country, but also to be able to assist those um, that have fled. Jordan today uh, is hosting by far the largest number uh, of Syrian refugees. Um, the numbers have just exceeded 460,000 uh, Syrians. Uh, that is 10 percent uh, of our population. And the alarming figures, if the rates continue, uh, as we're seeing uh, today, uh, will probably double uh, by the end of the year. So for the Americans uh, in the audience, that's the equivalent of 30 million refugees crossing into the United States, with the possibility of that going up to 60 million uh, by the end of the year, relative, obviously, to our populations. Uh, the refugee camp in the north, Zati refugee camp, today is the fifth largest city uh, in Jordan. Um, and obviously, this has added uh, economic and financial uh, costs due to the influx uh, and has further strained uh, the economy that is already under considerable external pressures uh, with an unstable region, a sluggish global economy that is still uh, recovering. But having said that, as I already alluded to, we are so grateful to the U.S. assistance in soldering this uh, enormous responsibility. And together, we continue to appeal to the international community for more help to face this humanitarian uh, calamity. We had the opportunity, obviously, to talk about the peace process, and we were very delighted uh, by the vision and the depth of wisdom that the President showed uh, over the past several days uh, in his trip uh, with the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, obviously, I re reiterate Jordan's commitment uh, to the peace process and the crucial importance uh, of U.S. leadership in resuming uh, the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations based on the two-state solution. There is simply uh, no other formula, no other alternative. The two-state solution is the only way to go, and if you compare that also with the radicalization of Syria, together with the impasse in the peace process, this is going to be a serious threat to an already volatile uh, region. I believe there is a window of opportunity to make a serious push for resuming negotiations uh, on the final status issues. Uh, but the window, I believe, is fast closing, primarily due to uh, increasing settlement activities, and so there is no time uh, to waste. Uh, and lastly, I had the opportunity uh, uh, with um, the Prime Minister-designate uh, to share details of Jordan's homegrown uh, reform model and its supporting uh, roadmap. Um, we believe that we have a model that is, uh, has a clear uh, end goal uh, of parliamentary government with milestones and prerequisites. Uh, built on a strong democratic uh, institutions that guarantees checks and balances of proper democracy, 
uh, an empowered parliament and a new uh, constitutional uh, court. We also have a new independent elections commission and we are looking at Jordan as a model that is evolutionary, consensual and peaceful uh, and ensures pluralism, openness, tolerance, moderation and unity and equally as important, a level playing field. Uh, this will ensure uh, safeguards for civil liberties and political rights and obviously encourage uh, political participation. Uh, today, uh, we're looking forward to our Prime Minister Zenele uh, forming his parliamentary government, hopefully in the next uh, couple of weeks, based on his consultations with Parliament, which is an extension of the same consultation process that led to his designation as a result of receiving the highest number of nominations. So I'm very proud of the progress uh, so far. Uh, the hard work is definitely ahead of us. Uh, this is uh, the Jordanian model. What we're saying is the third way uh, in the Middle East. Um, what we are saying uh, that the Arab Spring is behind us. Uh, we in Jordan are looking now at the Arab uh, summer uh, for us all, which means that we all have to roll our sleeves. It's going to be a bumpy and difficult road, but I'm very encouraged with the process, and I am uh, very excited about the future. So again, Mr. President, uh, very welcome to Jordan. Uh, I wish you all the success in what you've been able to achieve in the past several days, and I hope that uh, the success will continue in your visit here to Jordan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be back in Jordan. Uh, I'm grateful to my good friend, uh, His Majesty King Abdullah. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, thank you to the Jordanian people for uh, the extraordinary warmth and hospitality uh, that I remembered well uh, from my first visit uh, as a senator. Uh, the thing I mainly remember uh, when I came here was that uh, His Majesty was kind enough to personally drive me to the airport. Uh, I won't tell you how fast he was going, but uh, Secret Service, I don't think, could keep up. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, we're very much uh, appreciative for you welcoming me and my delegation. Uh, the reason I'm here is simple. Uh, Jordan is an invaluable ally. Uh, it is a great friend. Uh, we've been working together since the early years of the kingdom under His Majesty's great-grandfather, King Abdullah I, who gave his life in the name of peace. Uh, today, our partnership in development, education, health, science, technology uh, improve the lives of our peoples. Our close security cooperation helps keep your citizens and ours safe from terrorism. Your military and police help train other security forces from the Palestinian Authority to Yemen. And I'm especially grateful uh, to His Majesty, uh, who, like his father, uh, memorialized by the mosque I saw when I arrived, uh, is a force for peace uh, in word and in deed. Uh, you've invested deeply and personally in strengthening the ties between our countries. And that's why you were the first Arab leader I welcomed to the Oval Office uh, when I became president. Uh, and I very much appreciate the work we've done together on a broad range of challenges. Uh, so I've come to Jordan to build on uh, what is already a very strong foundation and to deepen what is already uh, extraordinary cooperation. As His Majesty mentioned, today was a chance for me to hear from him about the necessary political reforms that are underway here, and I want to commend the people of Jordan on this year's parliamentary elections, which represented a positive step toward a more transparent and credible uh, and inclusive political process. Uh, I appreciated hearing His Majesty's plans for a parliamentary government, the response to the aspirations of the Jordanian people, and I very much welcome his commitment to active citizenship, where our citizens play a larger role in the future of this nation. You know, at a time of so much change and tumult across the region, I think His Majesty recognizes Jordan has uh, a great opportunity to show the benefits of genuine and peaceful reform, including stronger political parties and good governance uh, and transparency, all of which makes government more effective and make sure that uh, the people feel uh, a connection to their government. Your Majesty, you've been a driving force for these efforts, and uh, you can be assured that the United States will continue to work with you and Prime Minister Ensour uh, as you build on this progress. Uh, we also discussed the economic progress uh, that has to come with political progress. Uh, the Jordanian government is working hard to manage its current budget challenges. Uh, I think His Majesty outlined uh, the enormous pressures that Jordan uh, is experiencing, uh, often not because of any factors internal, but rather uh, a range of external factors as well. Um, and I recognize that while the economic reforms are difficult, 
uh, they are essential uh, over the long term to creating the kind of growth and opportunity and dynamism uh, in the economy that will help the Jordanian people achieve their dreams. So we want you to succeed. Uh, so my administration is therefore working with Congress to provide loan guarantees to Jordan this year. Uh, together, I believe we can help deliver the results that Jordan, uh, Jordanians deserve to see their uh, schools better, their roads improved, health care, clean water, uh, all enhanced. Uh, the training to, that I know a lot of Jordanians seek, uh, particularly young people, to get a job or to turn entrepreneurial skills uh, into a business that creates even more jobs. You know, I, I was proud to welcome some young Jordanians to the entrepreneurship summit that I hosted back in Washington. And we're going to continue to focus on creating economic opportunities. The people here in Jordan opportunities as people everywhere. People, um, we spent a good deal of time, and I updated His Majesty and President Abbas. Uh, as I said in my speech yesterday, I believe there are side, uh, steps that both sides can take to build confidence and trust and move uh, a serious negotiation forward. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, I'm confident that it can happen, uh, in part because it must happen. Uh, it will be good for the Israelis, and it will be good for the Palestinians. Uh, I'm very grateful for His Majesty's readiness to advance these efforts. Uh, as has been true in the past, His Majesty and Jordan will be critical uh, to making progress towards a just and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and we spent a significant amount of time consulting on Syria. I want to commend His Majesty for his leadership, and I want to commend the Jordanian people for uh, their uh, compassion uh, during an extraordinarily difficult time for their neighbors. Uh, his Majesty was the first Arab leader to publicly call on Assad to step down because of the horrific violence that was being inflicted on the Syrian people. Uh, Jordan has played a leading role in trying to begin a political transition toward a new government. We're working together to strengthen uh, a credible Syrian opposition. Uh, we share Jordan's concerns about violence spilling across the border, so uh, I want to take this opportunity to make it clear the United States is committed to the security of Jordan, uh, which is backed by our strong alliance. Uh, as has been mentioned, during this crisis, the Jordanian people have displayed uh, extraordinary generosity, but the strains uh, of so many refugees uh, inevitably uh, is showing. Every day uh, to neighbors far from home, but this is a heavy burden and the international community needs to step up to make sure that uh, they are helping to shoulder this burden. Uh, the United States will, our, uh, will certainly do our part. Uh, we are already the single largest donor of humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people. Uh, some of this has helped people here in Jordan, and today I'm announcing that my administration will work with Congress to provide Jordan with an additional $200 million in budget support uh, this year as it cares for Syrian refugees and Jordanian communities affected by this crisis. This will mean more humanitarian assistance and basic services, including education for Syrian children uh, so far from home whose lives have been upended, uh, and I think as parents, we can only imagine uh, you know, how heartbreaking that must be for uh, any parent to, to see their children uh, having to go through the kinds of uh, uh, tumult that they're experiencing. Our cooperation on Syria is an example of how the partnership between the United States and Jordan improves the lives not only of the Jordanian people, but peoples across the region. So uh, again, Your Majesty, I want to express my great appreciation for our partnership. I want to thank you and the Jordanian people for the friendship and hospitality that they've shown me uh, and to my fellow Americans. And just as I visited the Citadel here in Amman on my last visit, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Petra tomorrow, uh, weather permitting. Uh, one of the great wonders of history uh, that the world can experience thanks to the care and dedication of Jordan and its people. So. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Your Majesty, Mr. President. Uh, I want to ask you, Your Majesty, for how long are you going to keep your borders open for the Syrian refugees? 
next to you is a land of war, and anything could happen anytime. If the regime, let's say, shut the electricity or the water, you're not too far from the Damascus, from the capital. It's like less than one hour, you might find a thousand, a thousand of refugees. Not just the number that you spoke about, it, Your Majesty. And Mr. President, uh, thank you again. And uh, I just want to know, you are a superpower. You are leading the superpower, United States of America. You don't have a plan to put an end for what's going on in Syria, the bloodshed, the killing. And now they are talking about using the chemical weapon. What's your comment about that? Thank you, Your Majesty. Well, uh, first of all, um, uh, Saad, um, uh, the, the problem with um, refugees comes down to a humanitarian issue. I mean, how are you going to turn back women, children, and the wounded? Um, w this is something that we just can't do. It's not the Jordanian way. We have historically opened our arms uh, to many of our neighbors uh, through many decades of Jordan's history. Um, so that, that is a ch challenge that we just can't turn our backs on. Um, so that's the reality that we're facing uh, on, on the ground. So Jordan has always been a safe haven uh, to, to, to people around us uh, through many, many decades. Um, so unfortunately, from that point of view, refugees will continue to come to Jordan, uh, and we will continue within our means to, to look after them as best as we can. Um, the problem is obviously the, the burden it's having on Jordan. Um, the, it, we've tried to quantify it as much as possible. The latest figures is it's going to cost us roughly $550 million uh, a year. But if those figures double as we think they will by the end of the year, uh, then obviously uh, we're talking uh, a billion plus. Not only is that uh, a problem, but it's going to be a tremendous strain uh, obviously uh, on infrastructure um, and it's creating social problems and security problems. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that we're, we're asking for the international community uh, to help. Uh, but physically, you can't turn away uh, young uh, children, uh, women, uh, people in desperate needs and the wounded. Um, so we will continue to burden uh, that responsibility. Since the start of uh, the situation in Syria, we have stepped up uh, as uh, not just uh, a superpower, as you've phrased it, but also because of basic humanity, uh, to say that Assad had needed to go. Uh, we haven't just uh, led with words, but we've also led with deeds. As I indicated, we're the single largest humanitarian donor uh, to the Syrian people. Uh, we have worked diligently uh, in cooperation with the international community to help organize and mobilize a political opposition that is credible because in the absence of a credible political opposition, uh, it will be impossible for us to transition to a more peaceful uh, and more representative and legitimate uh, government structure inside of Syria. Uh, and that's an area where we have uh, been involved on almost a daily basis. Uh, first, Secretary Hillary Clinton uh, helped to spearhead the efforts that formed uh, a, uh, a coherent, Syrian Opposition Council. Uh, now you've got Secretary Kerry, who's deeply involved in that effort as well. Uh, and we are providing not just advice, not just words, but we're providing resources, training, capacity, uh, in order for that political opposition to maintain links within Syria uh, and to be able to provide direct services uh, to people inside of Syria, including uh, uh, the kinds of uh, relief efforts that uh, obviously We've, we're seeing here in Jordan, but uh, there are a whole bunch of people who are internally displaced inside of Syria who need help. Um, I think that uh, what your question may be suggesting is uh, why haven't we simply uh, gone in militarily? And, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, the United States uh, often finds itself in a situation where if it goes in militarily, then it's criticized for going in militarily. And if it doesn't go in militarily, then people say, why aren't you doing something militarily? Uh, and you know, my response at this stage is to make sure that what we do contributes to bringing an end to the bloodshed as quickly as possible. Um, and working in a multilateral context, in an international context, be because we think our experience shows 
that when we lead, but we are also working with others, like the Jordanians, like the Turks, like other interested parties in the region, then the outcomes are better. Uh, when we are working with the Syrians themselves, so that this is not externally imposed, but rather something that uh, is linked directly with the aspirations and hopes of the people inside of Syria, it will work better. Uh, and you know, so we are going to continue to use every lever and, and every bit of influence that we have to affect the situation inside of Syria. Uh, you mentioned the issue of chemical weapons. We uh, have called for, and we know that the UN is now moving forward on an investigation of exactly what happened. We're monitoring the situation ourselves. Uh, I have said publicly that the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime uh, would be a game changer from our perspective. Uh, because once you let that uh, situation spin out of control, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to stop. Uh, and can have enormous spillover effects uh, across the region. Uh, and so we are going to continue to closely consult with everybody in the region and do everything we can to bring an end to uh, the bloodshed and to allow the Syrian people to get out of a leader who has lost all legitimacy because he is willing to uh, slaughter his own people. Uh, and, and I'm confident that Assad will go. It's not a question of if, it's when. Uh, and so part of what we have to spend a lot of time thinking about is what's the aftermath of that? Uh, and how does that work in a way that actually serves the Syrian people? And by the way, serves the Syrian people from all walks of life, from all uh, religious uh, affiliations. Uh, because you know, one of the things that we know is happening in this region is that uh, you know, if, if, if we fail to create a model in uh, the Arab world in which uh, people can live side by side, regardless of whether they are Shuni, uh, Sunni or, or Shia or Alawite or Druze, uh, regardless of uh, the manner in which they worship their God, uh, if, if we don't uh, create that possibility, uh, then these problems are going to recur again and again and again and again. Uh, I think His Majesty understands that. I think the people of Jordan understand that. Uh, and these kinds of sectarian and tribal uh, uh, fault lines uh, are part of what uh, we have to get beyond uh, because they don't work in a modern world. They don't create jobs. They don't put food in the mouths of children. They don't provide an education. They don't. Uh, create a thriving economy, uh, and, and uh, that's going to be a central challenge, not just in Syria, but uh, across the region. And the United States, I think, has something to say about that because uh, part of what makes us a superpower is because we have people of every walk of life, every background, every religion. And if they've got a good idea and they're willing to work hard, they can succeed. And that's got to be uh, something that's more consistently spoken about, uh, not just in, with respect to the Syria situation, but I think uh, with respect to this em enormous moment of both promise but also danger uh, in the Arab world and in North Africa. Uh, Julie Pace. Thank you, Mr. President. You mentioned the aftermath of the Assad regime. There's a lot of concern in Jordan and elsewhere that the upheaval in Syria is creating havens for extremism. Yep. How concerned are you at this point that extremists or jihadists could actually take over in Syria and perhaps be even worse than Assad? And I was also hoping you could give us some insight into how you brokered the call today between Prime Ministers Erdogan and Netanyahu and how much of their willingness to talk do you think is actually driven by the urgency in Syria? And your Majesty you have offered Assad asylum, which he rejected. Does that offer of asylum still stand? Thank you. Um, well, I am very concerned about Syria becoming an enclave for extremism uh, because extremists thrive in chaos. They, they thrive in failed states. They thrive in power vacuums. They don't have much to offer when it comes to actually building things, but they're very good about uh, exploiting uh, situations that, uh, you know, are no longer functioning. Uh, they fill that gap. 
Uh, and that's why I think it's so important for us to work as an international community to help accelerate a political transition that is viable so that a Syrian state continues to function, so that the basic institutions uh, can be rebuilt, that, that they're not destroyed beyond recognition, uh, that uh, you know, we are avoiding uh, what inevitably becomes uh, Syrian uh, or, or uh, sectarian uh, divisions, uh, because by definition, if you're an extremist, then you don't have a lot of tolerance for people who don't share your beliefs. Uh, so uh, this is part of the reason why, for the American people, we've got to recognize we have a stake here. Uh, we can't do it alone. And uh, the outcome in Syria is not going to be ideal uh, even if we execute our assistance and our coordination and our planning and our support flawlessly, the situation in Syria now is going to be difficult. And that's what happens when you have a leader who cares more about clinging to power than they do about uh, holding their country together and uh, looking after their people. Uh, it's tragic. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and the sight of children and women uh, being slaughtered uh, that we've seen so much, uh, I think, has to compel all of us to say, what more can we do? And that's a question that I'm asking as president every single day, and that's a question I know His Majesty is asking uh, uh, in his capacity here in Jordan. And um, you know, what, I, what I am confident about is that uh, ultimately what the people of Syria are looking for is not replacing oppression uh, with a new form of oppression. What they're looking for is replacing oppression with freedom and opportunity and democracy and uh, the capacity to live uh, together and build together. And that's what we have to begin planning for now, uh, understanding that it is going to be difficult. Something has been broken in Syria, and it's not going to be put back together perfectly immediately. Uh, anytime soon, even after Assad leaves. Uh, but we can begin the process of moving it uh, in a better direction, and having a cohesive political opposition, I think, is critical to that. Uh, with respect to uh, the conversation that took place between Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and Prime Minister Erdogan, um, I have long said that it is in both the interests of Israel and Turkey to restore uh, normal relations between two countries that have historically had good ties. Uh, it broke down several years ago uh, as a consequence of the flotilla incident. Um, for you know, the last two years, I've spoken to both uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Prime Minister Erdogan about why this rupture has to be mended, that they don't have to agree on everything. Uh, in order for them to come together around a whole range of common interests and common concerns. Uh, during my visit, it appeared that the timing was good uh, for uh, that conversation to take place. Uh, I discussed it with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and uh, uh, both of us agreed that uh, the moment was right. Uh, and fortunately, uh, they were able to uh, begin the process of rebuilding uh, normal uh, relations between two very important countries in the region. Um, you know, this is a, a work in progress. It's just beginning. Uh, as I said, there are obviously going to still be some significant disagreements uh, between uh, Turkey and Israel, uh, not just on the Palestinian question, but on uh, a range of different issues. But they also have a, a whole range of, of shared interests, and they both happen to be uh, extraordinarily strong partners and friends of ours. Uh, and so it's in the interest of the United States uh, that they begin uh, this process of, of uh, getting their relationship uh, back in order. And I'm very glad to see that it's happening. Thank you. Um, I think um, the question about asylum is something that um, Assad has to answer to himself. First, is he interested in asylum, and would he be interested in coming uh, to Jordan? Uh, and obviously, uh, from our point of view, is we're saying that we need a, an inclusive political transition as quickly as possible. So if uh, the issue of asylum um, ever came up, uh, that's something that I think all of us would have to put our heads together and figure out whether or not, if that sort of ends the violence quickly, uh, is something worth pursuing. So uh, that's a question that's slightly beyond my pay grade this stage. 
um, but uh, um, um, something that uh, I, I'm sure if it ever came up would be something that we discussed at the level of the international community. Um, Samir? Thank you, Your Majesty. Uh, Your Majesty, last year, Jordan managed to break the impasse in the peace process by hosting the Amman talks, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together at the negotiating table. Now, there was no follow-up to that. Uh, do you have anything in mind, or uh, are you going to have any similar effort? Uh, Mr. President, would you support any such effort, particularly that we know that the two sides need to be prodded back to the negotiating table? Thank you. Well, um, Samira, at this stage, um, obviously, um, last year we um, kept uh, Israelis and Palestinians uh, or the dialogue g going uh, simply because uh, we wanted to keep the process uh, alive as much as we could, uh, knowing full well that uh, we are waiting for this opportunity. The, the President uh, has, I think, uh, finished a very successful uh, visit to both the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, we have been in close contact with State Department leading up to this visit. Uh, and I think um, 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 uh, Secretary Kerry has been uh, very right in keeping expectations low uh, so that um, what I call the homework stage uh, is still in effect. Um, obviously, we're all consulting at this stage of how to build on this visit, uh, and I believe that uh, as we all share notes, uh, we'll have a better understanding over the next several weeks what is the next step. Uh, Jordan's role is to be there uh, as a facilitator and support to both Israelis and Palestinians uh, to bring them uh, closer together so that I believe in the next uh, um, several weeks to this next several months, uh, we'll have um, um, the, the, the homework or the framework uh, that allows both sides uh, to come together and move forward. Uh, so Jordan obviously uh, will welcome hosting Israelis and Palestinians together if that's what they want. And we always have been uh, in a support mode for both uh, sides. And as I said earlier, uh, we see a, a window of opportunity, and I believe the statements that the President has made to the Israeli and to the Palestinian um, is uh, an opportunity to re-galvanize the effort, uh, and one that we will stand by in support mode as we compare notes uh, of, of the President's visit to uh, the three countries. Uh, well, first of all, I think His Majesty described uh, uh, what I've tried to accomplish on this trip uh, very well. This is a, a trip to make sure I'm doing my homework. Uh, we all recognize how vital uh, it could be to see a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We set expectations low precisely because there's been a lot of talk uh, over decades, uh, but it hasn't produced the results that everybody wants to see. Uh, and so uh, my approach here has been let me listen to the parties first. Let me find out exactly what the roadblocks are for progress. Uh, let me discuss with them ways that we might move those roadblocks out of the way in order to uh, achieve uh, a concrete result. And I've also been modest because, frankly, uh, peace will not be achieved unless ultimately the parties themselves want peace. Uh, you know, I, I think all of us in the international community share this frustration. Why can't we get this problem solved? Uh, I think the Israeli people are frustrated that they feel that this problem is not solved. They don't enjoy the isolation uh, that uh, has resulted from this conflict. I think the Palestinian people certainly feel that frustration. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my speech yesterday, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with young people uh, who are growing up uh, unable to uh, do the basic things that uh, a free people should expect they should be able to do. Um, simple things like travel. Uh, or enjoying the kinds of privacy in their own homes that uh, so many of us take for granted. And these are children, these are young people, these are young men and women who, uh, as I described yesterday, aren't very different from my daughters. Uh, and they deserve the same opportunities. Uh, they deserve this cloud to be lifted from, uh, from their lives because they can achieve, uh, and they have enormous potential. 
Uh, and I don't want them living up under a, uh, a sense of, of constricted possibility. I also don't want the Israeli people continually looking over their shoulder thinking that at any point their house may be uh, hit by a rocket uh, or a bus may be blown up. And so, you know, part of the tragedy of, of the situation has been that uh, neither side is getting exactly what they want, but it's not been possible to break out of uh, old patterns uh, and a difficult history. So my, my hope and expectation uh, is that as a consequence of us doing our homework, uh, we can explore with the parties uh, a mechanism for them to sit back down, to get rid of some of the old assumptions, to think in new ways, uh, and to get this done. And I think if, if, if it gets done in a timely way, then the Israeli people will be safer and the Palestinian people will be freer. Uh, and children on both sides uh, will have a better life. And as a consequence, the region in a whole, as a whole will be strengthened and the world will be safer. Uh, I can't guarantee that that's gonna happen. What I can guarantee is we'll make the effort. What I can guarantee is that Secretary Kerry is gonna be spending a good deal of time in discussions with the parties. Uh, what I can assure you is, is that uh, nobody feels uh, a greater interest in us achieving this than uh, His Majesty. Uh, and so we're just going to keep on plugging away. Uh, the one thing I did say, uh, I think to both sides, is uh, the window of opportunity still exists, but it's getting more and more difficult. Uh, the mistrust is building in s instead of ebbing. Um, the logistics of uh, providing security for Israel get more difficult uh, with new technologies. Uh, and the logistics of creating a contiguous and functioning Palestinian state become more difficult with settlements. And so both sides have to begin to uh, think about their long-term strategic interests instead of worrying about uh, can I gain a, a short-term tactical advantage here or there? Uh, and, and say to themselves, what's the big picture? And, and how do we get this done? Um, and that's ultimately what uh, I believe both peoples want, which is why I think it, I think it was very interesting that in my speech uh, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, some of the strongest applause came when I addressed the Israeli people and I said, you have to think about these Palestinian children like your own children. It tapped into something that they understood inherently. Um, and that gives me hope. I think that, that shows there's a uh, possibility there, but it's hard. And I, what I also said was that uh, ultimately people have to help provide the structures for leaders to take some very difficult risks. Uh, so that's why I wanted to speak directly to uh, the Israeli people and uh, to pe the Palestinian people so that, that they help empower their leadership uh, to, to make some very difficult decisions and trade-offs in order to achieve uh, a compromise where neither side is going to get 100% of what they want. So we'll see if we can make it happen. Uh, John Carl. Thank you, Mr. President. King Abdullah. Uh, Mr. President, you have said repeatedly on this trip and before that all options are on the table to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, including military action. Yesterday, the supreme leader of Iran came out and said that if any action is taken against his country, he will raise the cities in Israel of Tel Aviv and Haifa to the ground. So my question to you is, are you prepared to deal with the retaliation, the fallout that would come after a military strike against Iran's nuclear facilities? And to uh, King Abdullah, if I can ask what you think would happen here, what would be the aftermath of a military strike, whether taken by the United States or by Israel, against Iran? What is a bigger threat to, its, to stability in this region, Iran with nuclear weapons or another war in this region? Well, first of all, John, you know, I'm not going to engage in a whole bunch of hypotheticals uh, because uh, what I've said 
from the moment I came into office was that the best resolution of this situation is through diplomacy. And I continue to believe that. Uh, we have organized uh, the international community around a, a sanctions regime that is having an impact on Iran. Uh, not because we forced other countries to do it, because they recognize that if you trigger a nuclear arms race in this region, as volatile as it is, if you have the prospect of nuclear weapons getting into the hands of terrorists and extremists, uh, that it's not just Israel that's threatened, it's a whole range of people that could be threatened. We're talking right now about the possibility of Syria using chemical weapons. What would be the conversation if Syria possessed nuclear weapons? So, th so this is not just a problem for Israel. It's not just a problem for the United States. It's a regional and worldwide problem. And by the way, we have been consistent in saying that nonproliferation is a problem around the globe, not just with respect to Iran. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that Iran has not been able to establish credibly with the international community that, in fact, it is simply pursuing peaceful nuclear power. There's a reason why it's subject to all these resolutions and violations identified by the United Nations. That's not something we made up. There are a lot of other countries who have the technical capacity, but for some reason, they are able to get right with the international community. Iran has not been able to do so. Now, if in fact what the Supreme Leader has said is the case, which is that developing a nuclear weapon would be un-Islamic, and that Iran has no interest in developing nuclear weapons, then there should be a practical, verifiable way to assure the international community that it's not doing so. And this problem will be solved to the benefit of the region and to the benefit of the Iranian people. You know, the Iranian people are celebrating uh, Nauruz, uh, their most important uh, holiday. And uh, I, every year I deliver a, a, a Nauruz message. And I remind the people of Iran that they are a great civilization. They have an extraordinary history. They have unbelievable power. They should be fully integrated into the international community, where they can thrive and build businesses and uh, expand commerce. And there should be exchanges and travel and interactions uh, with the Iranian people and, and everyone else, including the United States. That should be the vision, not threats uh, to raise Israeli cities to the ground. Now, part of, part of the frustration that uh, I think we all feel sometimes is uh, that it seems as if people spend all their time organizing around how uh, they can gain advantage over other people or inflict violence on other people. or. Uh, isolate other people instead of trying to figure out how do we solve problems. This is a solvable problem if, in fact, Iran's not pursuing a nuclear weapon. And so we're going to continue to apply the pressure that we have in a non-military way to try to resolve the problem. We will continue to try to pursue diplomatic solutions to the situation. But yes, I have said as President of the United States that I will maintain every option that's available uh, to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon because I think the consequences for the region and for the world would be extraordinarily dangerous. I, my hope and expectation is, is that among a menu of options, the option that involves negotiations, discussions, compromise, and resolution uh, of the problem uh, is the one that's exercised. But as President of the United States, uh, I would never take uh, any option off the table.
There's very little that I would like to add to what the President said. I think looking from the Jordanian point of view uh, and the challenges that uh, Jordan faces as we look around uh, the region, uh, the challenges of what the Israelis and the Palestinians will be facing in 2012, the instability as you're seeing uh, in Syria, we have the concerns as what's happening in Iraq. Any military action uh, at the moment, whether Israeli or Iranian, uh, to me at this stage is, is Pandora's box because nobody can guarantee what the outcome will, will be. Uh, so hopefully there is a, uh, another way of resolving this problem. Uh, at a time with so much instability in the Middle East, we just don't need another thing uh, on our shoulders. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you to the people of Jordan.